Good afternoon and welcome to the PRISM e-symposium. My name is Erica Clefane and I will be serving as moderator for this session. I would like to introduce my co-moderator, Jonathan Gibson. Hello. You are in the Forensic Science Concurrent Session. This session will have two parts, one from 5 p.m. to 5.30 p.m. and one from 5.35 p.m. to 6 p.m. In this session, we will hear from students presenting on topics related to forensic science. If you have questions, audience members, please use the Q&A button below to write them and send them in. We will select questions at the end of each presenter, after each presentation for our presenters. Next slide, please. Our first presenter is Derek Casarubias, and the title of the presentation is artificial and natural chamois skin as a human skin simulant. Take it away, Derek. Hi everyone. Uh, so when many people think about homicides, they often think about guns. Many crime shows have even depicted guns as having a large role in forensic science. This has led many people to believe that ballistics is the study of guns. However, this is technically wrong. Um, next slide, please. Oh, although guns are, oh, can you go back a slide, sorry. Although guns are involved, ballistics actually refers to the study of a projectile's movement. Projectile can be pretty much anything, but the objects of interest in forensic science are typically bullets. Ballistics can be split into three categories. What occurs within the firearm, what happens after a bullet leaves a firearm, and what happens when a bullet hits a target, also known as wound ballistics. Next slide, please. When a bullet enters the body, it crushes and shreds any tissue in its path, and a wound is eventually formed. By using wound ballistics, we're able to understand how these wounds from when form when different projectiles shot from different firearms impact human tissue. Wound ballistics has also helped us understand that the appearance of a wound depends on the firearm used, the type of projectile, and its velocity. Next slide, please. Reconstructions of crime scenes are used to gain a better understanding of the events that took place. One of the uses of reconstructions includes being able to identify whether a firearm of interest may have caused an injury found in a victim. One main requirement of reconstructions is that they require human body representation. Although the best representation will be human tissue, ethics lead many scientists to use simulants instead, which are materials similar to human tissue. Commonly used muscle substitute is ballistics gelatin, which can provide valuable information regarding the formation of a wound. However, we humans are not only made up of muscles. We also have a thin layer of tissue surrounding our bodies called skin. Skin simulants can be used to obtain more accurate data and the most common skin simulant is pig skin, as it is structurally similar to human skin. Next slide, please. However, a large issue encountering when working with pig skin is that it has, uh, has a low shelf life, meaning that experiments must be done quickly before the pig skin degrades. Pig skin may also be difficult to store due to having to be refrigerated. Some alternative skin simulants have been looked into include synthetic polymers and chamois cloth. However, there's a lack of knowledge as to whether or not they're effective in reconstructions. Next slide, please. Unlike pigskin, chamois does not have a short shelf life and can be stored easily without having to be refrigerated. Chamois is also cost efficient and can be purchased in bulk. Previous studies have even found that chamois share similar mechanical properties with human skin. Therefore, it's believed that natural and artificial chamois cloths will be a viable alternative to pigskin. Next slide, please. In my project, I conducted a series of shooting tests to study how the chamois affects how much a pellet penetrates the gelatin when fired from an air rifle. Since firearms are often used at long distances, the distance between the muzzle and the gel were altered to see the chamois effectiveness at different distances. Firearms are also known to fire projectiles at different velocities, so different velocities were also employed. Velocities were recorded using an instrument called the Doppler radar, capable of tracking projectile as it travels through the air. Obtained values consisted of how far a pellet penetrated the gel, known as a depth of penetration, or DOP, and the pellet's initial velocity. Values were compared between the chamois cloths and were supposed to be compared to values obtained using pigskin. Next slide, please. However, before testing can occur on pigskin, the college closed due to the pandemic, and I wasn't able to draw comparisons between the chamois cloths and pigskin. A lot of the data I collected consisted of DOP values and initial velocities for the natural and artificial chamois cloths. But more testing have been conducted on the natural chamois. Majority of my Doppler radar data also unfortunately remains back in the lab, Nonetheless, the DOP values reveal that the chamois cloth affect the pellet's behavior. The same chamois cloths even produce similar results months after first use. Next slide, please. 
the data that has been collected for the chamois cloths are good indication that the material does in fact impact how a pellet interacts with the gel. However, since pigskin has yet to be tested under the same conditions, we can't confidently say that chamois cloths can be used in reconstructions. Once pigskin is tested, comparisons will reveal whether chamois is a viable alternative to pigskin. If the values are similar, then we could say the simulants can be used as human skin. If they're different, we can either conclude that simulants are more or less efficient than the pigskin. Future directions for this project includes being able to use the chamois cloths with live ammunition, since it's most likely someone will be shot with a pistol rather than an air rifle. These future tests will also give a better insight into the usage of chamois cloths as human skin simulants. Next slide, please. I would like to thank PRISM for purchasing the Doppler radar and materials used in my project, as well as Dr. Diachuk for assisting me throughout the project. I'd also like to thank Coach Vince Marino for lending the air rifle to the lab. Thanks, and that concludes my presentation. Thank you, Derek. I have a following question from the audience. What other skin stimulants exist and why did you choose chamois? So, as I stated in the presentation, you could use synthetic polymers or you can even use uh, goat skin, sheep skin. There's a whole wide range of them. Uh, but I chose chamois uh, because it's, uh, there's been studies that show that it contains similar mechanical properties to human skin. So mechanical properties includes like elasticity, tensile strength, hardness, etc. So this means that a projectile such as a bullet may interact similarly with chamois and human skin. Um, so, as, so we were curious in the performance of chamois cloths specifically as skin stimulants and reconstructions. Chamois cloths are also uh, easy to purchase and you can buy a huge amount for an affordable price. Thank you, Derek. Audience members, please remember if you have any questions for our presenters, you can use the Q&A button below to send them in. Next slide, please. Our next presenter is Francesca Cadiz, and the title of the presentation is Analysis of Optical Properties of Soils Using Polarized Light Microscopy for Forensic Applications. Take it away, Francesca. Thank you. Today I will be talking to you about an introduction to the field of microscopy and criminalistic soil forensic analysis. My research focuses on a visual methodology and working with these types of samples. I will be going over some basics and understanding how optical crystallography works, how it ties into my research, and what my results can convey. Next, please. Soils is composed of different materials. There is organic matter from plants and animals, rocks, grains, sands, etc. Minerals are also a main component in soil and can be found in rocks as well. For minerals, there are a set of optical properties that can be studied from using a polarized light microscope. Along with distinctive physical characteristics, minerals contain other optical properties. In an introduction to optical crystallography, many minerals contain other optic, sorry, <laughs> contain uh, optical characteristics under polarized light. Materials like crystals are said to contain at least one refractive index. Refractive index is the ratio of speed of light between two mediums. Materials, these type of crystals that we are able to uniquely research, and these observations are also known as conoscopic observations. Next. Crystals can be divided into two branches for discussion. We have uniaxial and biaxial crystals. Next. Uniaxial crystals contain one optic axis, a, signal, a single vibrational direction, and thus the direction of the propagation of light through the material. While the other principal refractive index is seen irrespective towards the direction of propagation. Biaxial crystals are also said to contain two optic axes. The difference in these two will, result, will be conveyed in the results. These crystal structures allow us to observe more in-depth properties of crystalline material, such as optic sign and optic angle. These properties can be visually represented or mathematically calculated. All of these unique determinations is to conclude that these characters are distinctive to each species of crystal that can be analyzed. Next, please. I hope to create and understand a visual representation of minerals that can be found in soil examination. Although there are hundreds of different types of minerals in the world, only about 20 types are common in soil. Given this type of information, this can be photographed and used as a reference for future sample identification. This can be used as a reference when working with samples as a mineral microscopist or as a geologist whose works are similar yet different. 
The objective was to produce a qualitative method in identifying minerals in an unknown sample. For primary mineralary methodology, the work includes seeing how anisotropic materials appear under polarized light microscope under these conditions. Working in determining the optical properties and learning to visualize results obtained. The minerals chosen for this portion of the experiment included quartz, hornblende, tourmaline, andradite, alamine, magnetite, and hematite. We obtained all these minerals stated above and created a detailed chart explaining physical characteristics. Next. Here we see how quartz and hematite differ based on crystal structure and shape conoscopically. These microscope slides were prepared using an oil immersion technique. The first examination was an orthostopic view of each sample. This means that we took a look at how they look under a regular microscope. And then samples were observed conoscopically as we are seeing here. Next. For a more detailed representation of the properties being discussed, while the background is black due to the elimination of different wavelengths of light, the mineral samples under the microscope get to different colors, patterns, and shapes. Here we see the comparison of how different minerals look orthoscopically and conoscopically. Next. And finally, in discussing other optical properties, as mentioned before, interference figures give to the discovery of more, proper, more properties such as optic sign and optic angle. Next. Each mineral contained a individual visual spectrum that was specific to Excel. No two minerals gave similar characteristics and patterns. Because of this, these samples can be documented, documented, compared, and recognized throughout the methods we obtained our results. The last overall goal would be to compose a workbook of different experiments and materials we selected to analyze and that can be used for re future researchers. It will be a guide to many researchers and scientists. The goal was to provide aid in different fields involving minerals who want to understand this type of methodology, even if they have little or no knowledge of this field. They can be able to work in identifying any types of mineral compounds they come across using these techniques. Next, please. I'd like to thank Dr. Norefer for helping me with my research, and this concludes my presentation. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Francesca. Uh, we have a question from the audience. Uh, will your method be specific enough to distinguish the same type of soils, but from different geographical locations? Yeah, so our methodology going forward, um, our viewpoint going forward is that, although I did state that that there are only, well, there are common types of minerals in soils. Different geological profiles in different regions throughout the country and even the globe have different minerals distinctive to the lands that they're in. So this, um, so the procedure and the, the work that we're trying to do is working with what knowledge we have of soils that we have now and then using that to distinguish other regions that have soils and minerals unique to their environmental conditions. Great, thank you for clarifying. Thank you. Audience members, again, if you have any questions for our presenters, you guys can use the Q&A button below to write them and send them in. Next slide, please. Our next presenter is Floraba Giorgiova, and the title of the presentation is The Effect of Fentanyl Metabolites in Lucilia Sericata, how drugs can impact postmortem interval estimations. Take it away, Floralba. Thank you. Next slide, please. Good evening, everyone. Throughout this presentation, I'll be going over the project background and objectives, then the research approach taken, followed by the experimental results, and finally, the conclusions and future considerations. Next slide, please. Forensic entomology is used to estimate a postmortem interval, which basically backtracks to find time of death. One way this is done is by analyzing developmental rates of larvae, which depend on time, temperature, and species. The fly life cycle starts with eggs, which hatch into larvae. Larvae then undergo three developmental stages, first, second, and third instar, which is distinguished by their spiracular slits in their posterior end. Then they reach pupation followed by emergence to adult fly as insects are known to preserve toxicological information. It is important to determine if drugs can be detected throughout these developmental stages. Next slide, please. Given the rise of fentanyl-based deaths, 
My project focused on blowfly larvae to determine if fentanyl metabolites impact larval development and if the metabolites can be detected at various developmental stages. Next slide, please. The first step in my project was egg collection. Here, a piece of pork liver was placed in an adult colony cage where the flies were able to lay their eggs. Upon collecting the eggs, Upon collecting, the eggs were then transferred to fresh pieces of liver which had control consisting of no drug, norfentanyl spiked liver, and acetyl norfentanyl spiked liver. A hundred larvae were added to each liver and placed in mason jars where they were allowed to undergo the stages of, of development to adult emergence. Throughout the stages of development, six larvae were sampled per stage where three were dry samples and three were wet samples. Finally, upon reaching adult stage, the emerged flies were collected and measured for fitness. Next slide, please. Upon analyzing developmental notes I took throughout the experiment, developmental effects were apparent. For instance, larval size was affected such that control larvae were largest, followed by the acetyl uh, norfentanyl and the norfentanyl were smallest throughout all the developmental stages. Additionally, developmental rates were also affected while all of the groups reached second instar at the same time. At 96 hours, all of the control reached third instar while only 20% of norfentanyl and 60% of acetyl norfentanyl also reached third instar. Likewise, at 144 hours, 80% of control reached wandering, while only 10% of norfentanyl and 30% of acetyl norfentanyl reached the same stage. With respect to larval size, this trend was also evident. Next slide, please. I also analyzed accumulated degree hours, also known as ADH of pupation to emergence. Insects developmental rate is dependent on time and temperature and ADH is a developmental time unit used in entomology for developmental studies. As you can see in the pupation column, the developmental effects were pronounced as there was a 24 hour delay between control and the acetyl norfentanyl and a 48 hour delay between the control and the norfentanyl. Additionally, when you look at the emergence column, approximately all the control adults emerged at the same, at the same 1067.5 ADH, while the adults exposed to metabolites started emerging at this value, but had a range to 11,564.5 ADH. This uh, range demonstrates the flies trying to compensate for the developmental lag as they are emerging out around the same time, but not all of them are emerging at the same time, which is why there's such a large range. Next slide, please. The following results compared adult fitness of the flies from each group by comparing the lengths of the hind tibia, thorax, and the right wing. When looking at each sector measured, there's a clear pattern demonstrating control to have the largest sizes, followed by the acetyl norfentanyl and the norfentanyl being the smallest. For instance, when looking at the right wing length of the female adults of each group, which is highlighted in yellow, you can clearly see that the control has the largest, followed by the norfentanyl towards the end, and the, I mean the acetyl norfentanyl towards the end, and the norfentanyl being the smallest. Next slide, please. To summarize the results obtained, there were visible effects of the drug on larval size throughout all developmental stages. Additionally, there were de delayed rates of development from second to third instar, larvae, pupation, and upon emergence. This delay in rates of development is an important factor to keep in mind as it can alter postmortem in interval estimations, thereby skewing the accuracy of the time of death. Next slide, please. And for future directions of this project, I'd like to have the samples measured instrumentally with DART HRMS, which functions as real-time mass spectrometry. Preliminary data shows that these metabolites can be detected in larvae, thereby making larvae an important tool after death. Specifically, I'd like to explore how long larvae need to be exposed to the drug before it can be detected, and whether or not these toxins are purged in the pupil shell or the toxins are retained in the adult and thereby become incorporated into the ecosystem. Next slide, please. And with that, I'd like to thank you all for listening to my talk and I'd answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Floralba. Uh, we actually have a question from one of our audience members. Uh, can blowfly larvae development be used to detect other drugs? Uh, yeah, so the important use of blowfly larvae are that they can, um, they hold toxicological information. My last year's project, I actually analyzed whether um, morphine can be detected or can affect the development of the larvae. So this would be our next step. So yes, <laughs> final answer. Great, yes. great. And we also have another question. Um, can you please describe a little bit more about what adult fitness is? So um, in order 
I measured adult fitness by checking, like measuring the sizes of major components of their body sectors. So the healthier adults would have larger sizes while the adults that were exposed to metabolites tended to have smaller sizes. So they weren't as healthy and them being smaller sizes um, would lead to not having as strong of um, like survival rates as adults. Well, great. Thank you for uh, answering those questions for us. Thank you. Again, audience members, if you guys have any questions, please feel free to send them in using the Q&A button below. Our next and final presenter for this first session is Ayana Ikenochi, and the title of the presentation is Seuss Species Identification by Phylogenetic Analysis of the Cytochrome B Gene. Take it away, Ayana. Okay, thank you. So first of all, what is Seuss genes? It is, oh, next slide, sorry. So it is pigs. What we call pigs are classified into such species. In biology, living organism, organisms are categorized by seven ranks, and genius is a rank above species. In such genius, there are 10 species. Next. The pigs are important animals as a source of protein for most of us. Every year, a large amount of pork is consumed in the US. However, a scientist found that 35% 35, 35 of the meat product in the U.S. is mislabeled. It happens in, in the world, too. The food authorization is a big problem for human health, causing allergy reactions. So in order to prevent the organized food crime and protect human health, species identification has, has an important role. Next. The common method for identification is STR typing. In this method, by comparing the data of unknown samples with a reference DNA profile, the identification can be done. However, since there is no significant amount of data set as a reference for swing species, STR typing is not useful for pig species identification. But we all can access the large nucleotide database collected by the National Center for Biotechnology Information. And in the lab, the mitochondrial DNA sequences can be obtained from the sample, which are processed and stored in, the, in an extreme condition. So our question here was, how species can be identified from available data? The answer was phylogenetic tree analysis by applying the evolutionary differences in the DNA sequences. Next. So we hypothesized that whether a species can be identified by phylogenetic tree with the mitochondrial DNA of the sample and the large nucleotide database. Next. To build a phylogenetic tree, mega X which is the free software to analyzing DNA sequences was used. There are four main steps in this method. The first step is correcting DNA sequences from the database and sample. In this experiment, the cytochrome B gene, which is an evolutionary conserved gene producing an electron transporting protein was used. After the correcting data, sequence, sequence analy alignment was conducted. This is the process to arrange the DNA sequences to identify similar regions. After that, the phylogenetic tree was created by neighbor joining algorithm. This algorithm can calculate the evolutionary differences from the similarity of DNA sequences. Finally, the reliability of the tree was tested by using the bootstrap method. This is the statistical method to estimate the quality of the population by averaging the multiple number of samples. This is, oh, next. This is the constructed, pro, this is a constructed phylogenetic tree. It's showing that the most recent common ancestor of the unknown is Sassocrophia species. Next. However, since DNA sequences of the cytochrome B region of all of the 10 species under such genius could not get from the database, it is concluded that among the four species, the unknown is the species that is evolutionary closest to Sassocrophia species.
Next. The next step of this experiment is to correct the DNA sequences of other six species to build a complete phylogenetic tree of all 10 pig species so that identification can be done. To correct more data, the barcode of life data system can be used. Also, as a potential application, this method can be used for identifying the host of swim virus. Next. Thank you for, thank you prison program and my mentor Professor Ree for all his help and support. This is, this concludes my presentation. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Ayana. Uh, we have a question from one of our audience members. Um, how, can you explain how this method would be a little bit more useful for identifying the host of the swine virus? Oh, okay. So this phylogenetic method is, was based on the analysis of the conserved protein sequences. So in this case, cytochrome B gene was used for the species identification. Also, the virus has protein that are evolutionary conserved. So in the virus protein sequences, a uh, single base or amino acid changes must be observed. This might indicate the mutation that can help differentiate between trade. That's, so by applying the differences in the sequences, the distance between species and trade can be measured to build that progenic tree. So the host of the swing virus can be up identified. Great, thank you so much for clarifying. Thank you. And with that, we conclude our session. Uh, I would like to thank our presenters for their work and ask everyone in the audience to send them a big round of applause. Our next session on forensic science starts at 535 in the same room. You can stay here until it starts, but if you would like to check out a different session, you can close this window and go on to our website, www.jjay.cuny.edu slash prism and follow the links to join a different session. Thank you for joining us.